One thing every AI researcher knows, but few people outside of the community might know, is that most foundational AI research is actually happening in open source. Indeed, most AI researchers publish their research findings openly on Archive, a freely accessible, open repository originally mostly used by physics researchers. And the code underlying many AI breakthroughs is often published on GitHub, where it's readily accessible to anyone. Usually, these papers and code bases originate from the leading universities and tech companies. But the open culture in the AI community means that aspiring researchers can on their own access and study the latest AI breakthroughs and code bases, and in principle, from there, start making their own contributions. I'm saying in principle, because that's how I used to think of it. In principle possible, but likely too tall an order for anyone to make happen. Today's guest, Ross Whiteman, has shown this is actually possible. As a independent researcher, Ross has grown into one of the most prominent contributors to AI research and code bases. In a previous life, an engineer at a Canadian unicorn startup, his current full-time occupation is building new AI models that are freely available on GitHub for use by anyone and everyone. Ross, so great to have you here with us. Welcome to the show. It's amazing to be here. Well. Before we dive into what you're doing today, let's talk a bit about the journey, how you got here. As I understand it, you actually used to be an engineer at a um, Canadian startup. How do you land there and then how do you become an independent AI researcher and contributor? Well, okay, well, yeah, that story goes back to 2004. I was uh, working with a company doing scientific imaging, so cameras that go on micro microscopes, uh, low light, uh, low noise. A group got together and decided they wanted to to make great cameras for other applications. So we started a company that made uh, surveillance cameras, essentially, so IP video cameras. Um, we built the camera from the ground up, uh, all of the software in the back end uh, that recorded them, uh, transmitted them over networks for for viewing and accessing recording events and etc. cetera. Uh, so that startup, I was with them for for nine years from pretty much day one. Um, I was the original firmware developer and then I ended up taking over the software team as a sort of system architect and uh, tech lead there. And then, yeah, by the end, I was director of software firmware and we had built a pretty amazing system. Um, and uh, at some point it was time to, to move on to other things. Well, first of all, I think it's really interesting because in today's world, cameras seem just so readily accessible and, you know, building your own camera system seems almost crazy. But I remember from my own PhD student days working at the Stanford Helicopter Project, we had to put cameras on the ground to track the helicopters. And it was, it was a big endeavor to, you know, figure out what are the right cameras, which ones have enough bandwidth, enough resolution, low enough latency. And it was just a whole research project in itself to even buy the correct cameras for the problem. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you actually went ahead and, and completely built your own cameras. Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. From like the initial trial one, we call version one of the cameras was we did it through uh, FPGAs. So we were writing VHDL code and like controlling the sensors uh, with logic ourselves and streaming the data through the FPGA over the network. Uh, and then some pretty good uh, SOC chips became available. That had all the compression codecs built in, so we uh, started using those, and it saved a lot of time and effort. And now, yeah, you can pretty much just buy like camera kits that have most of the the code and the chip set up, and you just put it in your own housing, or you just you buy an OEM camera and tweak some of the the APIs inside. I mean, I gotta imagine back then, um, computer vision wasn't really working yet, right? When you started doing this, so maybe the cameras were just streaming, but not really intelligently processing the data yet? Yeah, that, that is a huge change. Actually, a kind of a scary change. Back then, it, it didn't seem like such a big deal, you know, making cameras for surveillance applications. There was always humans monitoring them, or after the fact, you'd go back and look at the recording. Um, the, 
the analytics at that stage were all pretty much hand tuned computer vision. They didn't work very well at all. And then a few years after I left that company and I was started tinkering with, uh, AI, it was like, wow, like this is incredible what you can do now. It's also very scary going back to that application specifically, what's, what's possible. And so at this point, I very much try to avoid overlapping those two worlds. Um, I know there's still lots of people working on it, but uh, it, it needs a lot of sensitivity in how you tackle the problems and how you deal with your data and what like the end use cases are. Why, why did you feel ready to leave the company and what was next for you in that moment? I feel I'm an early stage uh, company type person. I like to have my hands in everything. Um, things were going very well with that uh, company, but it was starting to grow into a larger company. The pace was starting to slow a little. Um, things were becoming a little bit more formal and the environment was just changing um, to the point where I decided I'd be, I guess, better off on my own. Um, or maybe starting something new. It seems like one of the things you started doing was angel investing. And the other thing is kind of just hacking on your own, plugging away at building your own AI systems. And the AI thing will be the main part of our conversation, of course. But I am curious to touch upon the angel investing part. Like, how do you get into that at the moment? And, and how's that going? Uh, it's going well. Uh, it comes in fits and spurts. After I left uh, the company, uh, I wanted to support other startups, especially in the Vancouver uh, ecosystem. Uh, so I joined some angel groups and started going to pitch events and talking to founders of interesting companies. And when I found a fit or an interesting idea, uh, I'd make an angel investment. I still do that. It just, yeah, I don't often find companies that sort of are in an area that I'm interested in or doing something exciting. Uh, Vancouver's uh, definitely much smaller uh, startup ecosystem uh, than the Valley, San Francisco, or many other American cities, or even worldwide cities. Uh, but it's 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 been improving steadily over the over the years. Well, often having strong universities is the feeding ground, or one of the big feeding grounds, as well as big tech companies where people get tired of um, you know working at a big company and want to do something new. So it seems like in principle, yeah. Vancouver should have it, you know, be able to have it covered. Yeah, it's, it's definitely getting, uh, definitely growing in, in the startup ecosystem. I'd definitely like to see more hardware, uh, startups here. Um, sometimes compared to the, the ambitions, uh, in the States, the, the targets in Canadian startups is a little more modest, uh, in tackling sort of the, the extra costs and complexities of, uh, hardware products or hardware or software hybrids, especially robotics is, I, I don't see too many. Uh, companies like say Covariant, uh, in Vancouver, there is one in particular that I was quite excited about recently, but, uh, yeah, not too many of those. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, robotics is always, you know, in some sense, once one or two or several notches harder than something pure software based, because once you're interacting with the physical world, mistakes become more costly. You can break physical things, which tends to be harder to repair and so forth. So, I mean... I can see why there's a natural trend towards you know, pure, pure software-based uh, products whenever possible, even though I personally, of course, love to put you know, real robots to work and, and get them to do things. Now, a lot of people, when they want to get into AI, they tend to join often either a university or a big company that has an AI research lab as part of their efforts, right? But in your case, as I understand it, you just started tinkering with it on your own. Can you say a bit more about that? How did you even start? What was your you know, initial thing you tried to do and grow from there? Well, after, uh, after leaving the company, um, started looking for you know, startup ideas, what would be next? Uh, so spent quite a bit of time brainstorming and tinkering. And a lot of the ideas and interesting things that I was seeing out there all revolved around uh, AI. So. That became a focal point. Uh, I didn't actually know that much about it at the time. So I figured, well, I've got to, I've got to learn and I learned by doing. So I found Kaggle and that's really how I started my, my journey, uh, in, in deep learning and AI was through Kaggle. I started entering in some challenges, 
uh, they're highly addictive. So at some point I had to stop that, but I learned a lot, uh, through doing that. Um, and that's actually how, uh, Tim, the PyTorch image model library started was, uh, collecting models for different vision based challenges on Kaggle. Eventually that became the thing that I started working on, uh, more and more as opposed to, to entering in the challenges. Now, I'm not sure everyone is going to be familiar with Kaggle. What is Kaggle? It's a, uh, a data science uh, competition platform where uh, data scientists, researchers, engineers, anybody really from around the world can compete in different uh, challenges around different uh, data science topics like vision, NLP. Different companies and organizations will come to them with a problem, uh, often a data set included, and uh, a metric that they'd like to evaluate the, the challenge on. And then people will enter in that and come up with solutions. And there's a leaderboard through the whole challenge. And then at the end, there's a winner or a, a number of winners ranked on the final uh, test metric. We've often talked about the ImageNet competition where you know, there was an image recognition competition that really led to the breakthroughs in AI that we're seeing today, the realization that deep neural networks are best at the problems we're trying to solve. And effectively, Kaggle is like multiple image nets running in parallel at the same time with data sets being posted, competitions being run on all kinds of problems, right? And the beauty is that, I mean, there's two sides to it. One side is what you were doing, you're solving the problems. But if somebody wants a problem solved, they can also post it on there and just see how all well people do on it and see if the problem is solvable or not. Yeah, no, it's a pretty, it's a pretty exciting platform. And definitely, like, it's a great way to learn and get involved. Um, even if you don't rank highly, it's pretty competitive, uh, especially now there's so many people on it, but you still can learn a lot. And just, just going through the forums and reading the solutions to the different challenges, it's pretty, um, pretty educational and eye opening how creative some of the solutions can be. Are typically the, the solutions published open source for the winners on Kaggle? Not always full open source. It depends on the terms of the specific challenge. But most of the winners will be more than eager to share their solutions, at least at a very high level in the forum. So if you go in after a challenge is ended, you'll typically see like solution for place number two, number three, and you can read through and see some of the block diagrams of their solution and some of how they, uh, they tackle the problem, even if they don't release the whole code. But sometimes that it is released as well on GitHub or wherever. So it's so interesting for me to learn about. So, I mean, for me, the, the, the way I would start learning typically would be like go to classes online and, you know, listen to what's being said there and try to do some homework exercises and, and work my way through. But in your case, you're just like, okay, Kaggle is where people compete, where the best people who want to, you know, test their, their, their capabilities effectively on new data sets go and, you know, try it out. And you just dove right into that, which is really intriguing to me. Yeah, that's definitely my learning style. I mean, I, I, I try to watch the videos and do as many online courses as I can, but I usually don't make it very <laughs> far bef before I get the urge to start hacking and uh, tinkering. I've like gone through some of your lectures, Andre's like so many different resources out there, but I always come back to just getting into the code and uh, trying to make things work. Now, of course, the beauty of the code is that in some sense, it's the ground tr truth, right? I mean, a lecture has abstractions, this higher level explanations but doesn't always cover how you get it to work because it often stays at a more kind of mathematical, symbolic level. Whereas once you're busy with the code, you know that if you have it up and running, you're all set. Th this, this is real. And especially since the machine learning, there is, there is train and test data. And the test data on Kaggle is actually, you, you don't have it available to yourself. It's run by the organizers. You actually know for real whether your system is, is doing well or not. Yeah. Now, the other thing you mentioned is that as you started participating in Kaggle competitions, you started using PyTorch. Uh, can you say a bit about what is PyTorch and how come it plays such a big role in everything AI deep learning these days? Well, uh, PyTorch is a Python-based machine learning framework. Uh, I would say it's fairly specifically focused on deep learning, but you can use it for pretty much anything. It's one of the more popular frameworks at this point in time, especially among uh, researchers who want to build things quickly, experiment, iterate fast. Um, it's got a great community, which was what uh, drew me to it uh, in the first place. 
from the ground up, it was designed to be, uh, to be I think, to be easy to use, uh, easy to experiment with. Uh, had quite a bit less boilerplate uh, than some of the other options out there. Although many of them uh, at this point are converging to a very similar uh, interface and user experience. So uh, PyTorch is now starting to look like many of the other options out there, or they are starting to look more like PyTorch. Um, but yeah, I still stick with PyTorch. I've been playing with actually Jax a bit too recently, and, and I've been enjoying that. Uh, it's pretty powerful uh, and, and pretty fun to, to play with. Um, and I think it will be pretty useful going forward, especially if you're doing larger scale um, machine learning, deep learning on, on TPUs and um, many uh, distributed systems. Going one step deeper, maybe, when you're working with, with PyTorch or other deep learning frameworks, what is it that you're actually doing as you try to compete in a Kaggle competition? Well, you're, you're looking for, I guess, if you're using deep learning as your approach, you're, you're looking for network architectures that uh, can perform well on, on your problem, uh, have enough capacity, but also at the same time um, will work within the constraints of the, the hardware that you have. Um, many of the Python-based libraries, especially PyTorch, make it really easy to switch out different networks, uh, change the layers, change the, the size of your models by scaling the amounts of uh, layers that are stacked together, uh, the image sizes, if you're doing image uh, challenge that you're feeding to the network, you can easily iterate through different choices of parameters that control the model um, architecture, the size of it, or the optimization parameters. So what kind of uh, optimizer you might be using what the learning rate is, and then also additionally, the the data that's being fed into um, the network. That's often the most important part. Um, making sure that you're handling the, the data well, uh, inspecting the data. Python notebooks are especially useful for for doing analysis of your data. Uh, and with Python-based frameworks plus the notebooks, you can iterate through training your model looking at your data, analyzing the results with your, your data in mind, uh, and just keep quickly iterating and improving um, the results. Now, there you are. You're, you're playing, well, playing or working slash playing with, uh, with PyTorch, and you're competing in these Kaggle competitions. Was there some kind of ramp up? How, how did you see this evolve for yourself from, you know, maybe initially being not so competitive to actually doing well in these competitions. And what were some of the things maybe that in your learning process were really helpful? I dove in there. Um, when I started, I didn't even know what a, what a ResNet was. And uh, I think when I got into Kaggle, it wasn't that long after. I started with Torch 7, which was like the old Lua-based pre-PyTorch um, in my first challenges and started Participating in the forums was huge, seeing what other people were doing, um, getting f feedback from the community was, was pretty, was pretty important to those early days. It always goes back to the data, which is, I, I love the modeling aspect and that's what Tim's been focused on. But really, when you're doing the challenges, uh, having a good model is important, but handling your data appropriately is really the, the key. Uh, and for Kaggle, especially also, um, Understanding the, the metric that your your challenge is uh, evaluated on is really important. And some challenges are won or lost based on hacking the metric almost, which, you know, maybe <laughs> not be a thing that they want to do in industry, but in Kaggle, it can get you a gold medal. <laughs> now, it's interesting because you, you start out, you know, thinking you're ready to start your next company, right? And you realize... AI is where a lot of the innovation is happening. You want to become familiar with that. You start diving into Kaggle, competing. And then at some point, something happened, right? Because right now, your deep learning models that you release on GitHub are often the standard reference, especially on Tim, the, the Torch image models uh, repo. It's, it's, it's becoming the reference for it anybody out there. And there you were, you're just this independent researcher doing your, your things on your own. All of a sudden, people start using your models. Was there a moment where you just saw this transition where all of a sudden you felt like you're just playing in competitions and all of a sudden people are using your work? 
it's amazing what has happened, but I've spent time going back trying to figure out where, if there was any aha moments. And I think it was just a long, continual evolution and grind. I mean, I'm a, I'm a grinder. I plug away at things until I, until I solve the problem or I get the result that I'm looking for. So yeah, after I decided to focus more on, on Tim, it's just been slow, but steady uptick. I was looking at my um, star, the chart of the GitHub stars recently for um, the presentation that I was uh, preparing. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a pretty steady ramp with a bit of a, an acceleration in the past year, especially um, just more and more people finding out about it. It's definitely like everybody on Kaggle these days that's doing image challenges seems to be aware of it. It's, it's used commonly there. People have, uh, captured the, some of the weights and, and models in uh, the standalone uh, notebooks that can be used in the offline challenges there. And then now researchers uh, and companies, organizations uh, are definitely using it based on messages that I'm getting and um, mm -hmm. discussion forums in the, on the GitHub repo and whatnot. Uh, there's been a couple, I think, key um, model architectures or papers that I've reproduced that sort of caused a little bit of a, a, a bump here and there. The Vision Transformers was a, a really big one. The Google Brain Zurich Group released that paper. And then I had the some code and the trained weights up before they managed to get their JAX version out. And uh, I think I had to change like two or three lines in my uh, paper-based reproduction before it, for it to match the actual official code, which was uh, pretty pretty neat. And then from that point, Many of the, the vision transformer variations, uh, have been based on the, the Tim, uh, code with the warts and all. I had a couple little mistakes in the first version that I smoothed over with a Boolean flag here or there to make it work with my original one or the official one. And that somehow managed to propagate into pretty much every vision transformer implementation that I've seen so far. And that's a really big deal, right? Because, I mean, if, if we think about, AI in the last 10 years, 2012 ImageNet moment with AlexNet, convolution neural networks, specific type of neural net architecture was trained to get the best image recognition performance. And since then, essentially convolutional neural networks, LSTMs, or recurrent neural networks for sequence modeling, were for many years the main architectures. But then a few years ago, the transformer architecture was introduced, right? Uh, mostly in natural language processing at first, but then the vision transformer was, in some sense, the first big breakthrough of that new architecture in computer vision. And when those things happen, the devil's in the details is always my impression. I'm sure you feel the same. And when the first time something like that happens, it's very hard to reproduce. And so when you come out with a piece of code that can actually do it just from the paper, that's pretty unique in the early days of such a new you know, neural net architecture to be able to train it properly. I noticed then, I mean, you, you've been hacking away um, Kaggle competitions, then your code becomes more widely used. And then actually you start writing papers and you, ha you put a paper on archive, how to train your vision transformer. How did that come about? That came about due to actually my reproduction in uh, Tim of the vision transformer. The Google group that, that worked on that made that paper, uh, Lucas uh, reached out to me um, afterwards and we, we started chatting a little bit. Uh, and then the, uh, the diet, uh, transformer models, uh, had come out around that time, uh, by a Facebook group. And we were discussing like the merits and differences. And they, the Google group really wanted to, uh, do some more work on training with, um, I guess smaller data sets or open accessible data sets like uh, ImageNet 21K uh, and show that it was easier to, or it was better to do transfer learning from more data than to try and crank up the augmentations and regularization and train just on ImageNet 1K. So they uh, involved me in that paper um, because it was very much focused on, uh, I guess, a practical application of visual, vision transformers and how to train them well. And uh, so we kind of did this hybrid. Uh, they did some of their research on their DAX implementation with their TPUs. And then I was doing uh, some of the experiments uh, on uh, GPUs 
um, and in the Tim code base. And we kind of pulled it all together uh, to make some observations about uh, augmentation and regularization in the context of uh, training your vision transform as well. Since those models are very data hungry uh, and they benefit from either significantly larger data sets or really, really, really cranking up the, the augmentation of your smaller data set to, I guess, essentially make it appear as if it's larger if your augmentations are um, like convincing in that they they fit uh, the natural Im- natural uh, images that you're using. Now, I'm curious because you, you're connecting with the Google team at the time. And I mean, I got to imagine at this point, people are also trying to recruit you, not just try to collaborate with you, but then, you know, they must, you know, at least hint at this notion of, well, maybe you could just join Google or could join, you know, any of the other companies, but you remain an independent researcher, right? And so I'm curious, what's your thinking around that? And, and you know, why is it so exciting for you to, be, to remain an independent researcher? Well, I guess I'm a bit of a lone wolf. I like to wake up in the morning and be the one to decide what I'm working on. Um, that, like, keeps me engaged. Um, and I, I move between so many different projects and ideas, uh, and I really enjoy that. And I guess... Being in a position where I I don't have to uh, rely on the paycheck, um, yeah, it, it just I prefer it this way. There's definitely been conversations uh, with different companies, and some of them have been intriguing. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, signing up like, just hasn't made it to uh, well on my priority list versus what I'm doing right now, which is building what I want to do, exploring the ideas that I want to, and contributing. To open source. Well, it's hard yeah. to imagine having a, having a bigger impact than the way you're open sourcing your models and they're being used. I mean, by pretty much everyone in Vision <laughs> looks at your models, builds on top of them. So it's it's hard to imagine having a bigger impact by you know pushing yourself inside one specific company. Um, but at the same time, when you're inside a company, often you know there are other benefits. Like um, you might have bigger compute resources, which does play a role in um, AI and deep learning. And so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you ensure that, you know, you can always run the experiments you want to run? Yeah, that, well, that's definitely been uh, a challenge that I've run into, um, well, I've run into quite regularly. I, as I get further into it, the experiments that I want to run start getting bigger and bigger and require more and more data, more compute, uh, especially in the past year. Um, some of the, the uh, side projects I've been working on, uh, especially related to video and um, some of the other uh, multimodal models, uh, I'd like to do more experiments on the sort of clip DALI style models. They require huge data sets and lots of compute. So the, the TensorFlow Research Cloud, or I guess it's TPU Research Cloud now, um, I'm, I'm a, a part of that and that's been super helpful. Uh, recently, uh, access to uh, TPUs in the cloud uh, for research purposes uh, from Google. Um, I actually spent some time on Tim adding support for PyTorch XLA, uh, I guess almost a year ago now, and it's been working pretty well for me. So I've been training many recent models on TPUs. Uh, some conversations with GraphCore uh, might uh, be able to get some experiments running on on their hardware once I add some support. That's still pretty early days. And also NVIDIA, they uh, some some Kagglers that I, I know that work in NVIDIA really pushed uh, my case and they uh, sent me a refurbished, uh, I guess one of their demo units of a DGX station, the V100 version. So that was quite helpful as well. It's heating my garage right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, winter time for you. You, you got pl- plenty of heating going on then. Once you have some of those GPUs running full time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in Whistler and it's it's already below zero. And the garage is like it's the tropics. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, maybe you need to distribute your uh, compute cluster over other um, other houses near you, and nobody needs regular <laughs> heating anymore. <laughs> and that should be my business. Uh, Selling heat you your house with, with uh, GPUs that are training models. I think I've seen a company actually that's uh, proposing to do some sort of furnace heater based on uh, the GPUs or some sort of accelerator. 
See, might as well, right? It seems a, it seems a waste to put GPUs in data centers where you then apply cooling, whereas other people are somehow just in a you know kind of wasteful way heating up their house with just you know burning gas or running some electrical heating without actually running compute. Yeah, should be interesting. Um, now, I think this is really intriguing that I mean the companies are st starting to realize in many ways the importance of these open source contributions because they're seeing that it helps what they're doing. It helps other people get up to speed and then they, even if they cannot hire you, <laughs> they can hire other people who know how to use your models and learn from you. And the interesting thing that I hadn't seen before until recently pointed out is that GitHub explicitly allows um, people to effectively endorse other people. And I was browsing that yesterday because I hadn't seen this before. It's possible to buy you a beer for those times when 3,000 plus GPU hours are tossed out the window due to bad hyperparameter settings. <laughs> <laughs> so next time it happens, you know, let, let me know. I'd love to buy you a beer <laughs> for, for that. Uh, yeah, yeah for, uh, the, the, the GitHub sponsors was a pretty uh, interesting program, and I, I signed up for that uh, eventually as my costs, and especially in cloud, uh, uh, started rising, and it's, it's been helpful. Several organizations... Uh, have contributed. Uh, Hugging Face is a, a sponsor. Uh, PyTorch Lightning um, and the uh, Oldify. They they they've sponsored me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed also Andre Kapathy himself, uh, director of AI yeah. Tesla. He's he's one of the sponsors, and that that's pretty awesome. And I noticed one yeah, of my no. students actually is one of your sponsors. <laughs> Arvind Srinivas is uh, one of your sponsors. I'm like, wow, my students are sponsoring. Uh, Ross, this is so awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, we had some inter interesting conversations about uh, some of his uh, hybrid transformer models, the uh, like uh, HaloNet and uh, Botnet, um, and he really liked the 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 repository, so he decided to uh, sponsor me and contribute. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing, and yeah, I, I recommend any, everybody to check it out because uh, you you put some creativity into the different kind of sponsorships you can take on. I also really like the. Uh, the burger that is fuel for late night debugging. I'm just imagining you, you know, working late at night and ordering a burger to uh, to keep it going. <laughs> now, on this topic, I mean, you mentioned it's nice. You you have no boss. You can focus on the things you want to learn, the things you want to contribute to, and you can do it all in open source because I mean, it's your work. You can put it out there for anybody to use. What does that mean in practice? What does a day in the life of Ross Whiteman look like? I mean, today, I guess you're on, you wake up and you're on the podcast, but let us pick a different day <laughs> than today. What does it tend to look like? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I get up and get through the, the normal start of the day breakfast type stuff. And then I sit, go upstairs and sit in front of my computer. And basically, there's so many things that I have written down on some lists of things that I could do. Sometimes it can be actually overwhelming just to sit there and be like, wow, that's a lot of things to, to, to tackle and check off. Uh, so I try to, I guess, cycle between longer term vision projects and, uh, taking little chunks of those. And I guess the more, more immediate, smaller, um, tasks, like, you know, fix some bugs, add this model. Uh, and one of my main goals is sort of a self-directed, um, researcher developer is just to always get something done, uh, not to get bogged down in all of the possibilities or all of the shiny things that can distract you. But at the every day to at least pick a couple things that I can make some forward progress on. Uh, and ideally by the end of uh, a week, show some uh, movement on some different tasks. Uh, so if I have a, a really challenging project or idea that I'm working on that maybe I'm roadblocked and I just can't make it through uh, an abstraction or a detail in a model is not training properly, it's blowing up. I'll put it down and then go back to the, the bug list or the, the other tasks and just pick something that's maybe a little simpler, switch gears, get that done, check it off, make some progress and then retackle the harder problems on another day or another week. Uh, and then like back to that also just part of promoting Tim and making people aware of it is to have something every week or two 
to to have a tweet about something interesting, a new development, uh, to keep engagement up and uh, like have a, a goal for for making that progress to be able to share it with people. I definitely know the feeling of having a a list of things that's way too long to make progress on on everything on on you know one day or even one week, and the importance of you know just being happy to take one thing at a time. But I'm curious, in your case, when, when you take that one thing and, and you go about your day, is this a day where you're just sitting there on your own? Is there a lot of online interaction with other people? What What is it like and, you know, when you're actually working on something? It's, uh, it's usually just me hacking away. Uh, I get into the zone and I'm kind of gone to the world, uh, working whatever I'm working on. Um, the interactions tend to come when there's issues or bugs or feature requests where people are um, pinging me, um, emailing me or through the, the GitHub uh, discussions or issue trackers, like asking questions about what I've built or I can't reproduce this or this is not working kind of thing. That's where most of the interactions come. Um, also with some like organizations that are using using the models, uh, there's conversations there. But on the day-to-day basis when I'm developing, it's like me, the code, and a bunch of papers all over the screen and just kind of digging away at it uh, until uh, I get hungry and it's like, okay, time to go eat something. <laughs> wow. And are, are there any, um, any things that you do to kind of, you know, mix things up? I mean, like, you know go for runs or play a musical instrument or are, are there other things you do to, you know, maybe keep sane? Because I imagine you cannot code, you know, 16 hours a day. Uh, I've got a 19 month old toddler. So that oh. was a big, uh, <laughs> big change in life. And uh, that's where most of my time outside of this uh, is spent these days. Uh, also, I mean, the angel investment thing that we discussed earlier, that's also definitely uh, I spend some time, I'll allocate some time for, for, for that, for discussions with different companies and, uh, due diligence and whatnot. Uh, before the toddler, um, being in Vancouver, Whistler, uh, I'm a very avid hiker, skier. So lots of, uh, off trail scrambling, hiking, backcountry skiing. Uh, yeah, that, that's, I, I still, I mean, with the toddler, we get up for, we go walking on the trails nearby, just not quite as, uh, adventurous or no like 2000 vertical meter days anymore. I hear that uh, children at young age can learn to ski uh, quite quickly. So you might not have to wait that long before uh, that's a thing again. <laughs> yeah, well, we just had some snow in the driveway yesterday, actually. We were trying to convince them to try and put on these little uh, plastic skis uh, with a little clip on the front to see if he wanted to go down the driveway. But he was like, no, I just want to ride my bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay. Likes riding a bicycle. I think skiing is not too far off. It might just be another half year or year. Yeah. Now, you put out another paper recently, actually. And I love the title, ResNet Strikes Back. Can you say a little bit, how did that come about? And it, it, in my mind, it's really, you know, deep learning, the devil is in the details. And it's people like you that spend so much time on the details that come up with new insights. But how does it come about for you and what were some of the new insights in this work? Yeah, that paper, uh, I think it was, it was a long time coming, actually. Uh, for people who are familiar with uh, Tim, uh, they'll know that I've trained a lot of my own uh, model weights on ImageNet over the past uh, year or two, uh, often to better um, accuracy or better uh, uh, performance than many of the original uh, weights that were trained when the models were first introduced in, in their original papers. So in doing that, I was often mixing up, recombining different training ingredients, especially on the augmentation side uh, and getting some really good results. And then I'd see like new papers with new architectures coming out and they were often comparing their new architectures uh, with, you know, ResNets uh, is a common one. Uh, but going back to the original a resonant paper and the original accuracy numbers posted there, which were trained not using many of the techniques that are now common. And so I felt, often felt that the, the comparisons were not fair. Uh, and it's like, yeah, well, your, your architecture is, is interesting for sure, but claiming that you're 3% or whatever better than a resonant, it's not actually true. Um, because you focused on, 
your architecture and setting up the training recipe for that. Uh, so that performs very well, but then the same care and attention wasn't spent on uh, the baselines, which it, it does make sense. It's hard when you're a researcher with limited time and limited resources to uh, focus on both your uh, uh, new idea and also spend the tam- same amount of time on all the other uh, uh, existing architectures. Uh, but I guess like at least some amount of effort or some awareness of um, whether there's better baselines or it can the, the comparison can be made a little bit more fair. Uh, and I often find that some of the techniques, uh, either architectures or optimizers or other augmentations, the, the new addition can be in the noise versus when, when you compare to better baselines. And the, the results might not actually be that significant if you spend more, a little bit more time uh, plugging away at the uh, the alternatives. Yeah, I know this might briefly be a little maybe too detailed for some of our audience, but I'm, I'm really curious, as you did this work, Ross, the devil's in the details. You uncovered the details that matter. What are the details of the training setup, the details of the augmentation that matter the most for a ResNet to do really well? Well, the, uh, I guess the, the key augmentations in the ResNet Strikes back paper that, uh, I think really make a difference. Rand augment, uh, is used, uh, extensively or applied quite heavily. Um, mix up and cut mix, uh, are also deployed. What do those three do? Okay. Well, Rand augment is a, it's a, it's, if you look at the output of this, you're like, huh? How can a model learn from that? It's like almost the original image is almost uh, unrecognizable in some case. Um, it randomly picks different augmentations and applies them to varying strengths. So the augmentations being something like, say, rotation, uh, translation, skew, um, also some color uh, augmentations uh, like inverting the image completely, the color channels, uh, solarize and posturize, which shift the bits in the image around almost to the point where you're like, that is, uh, doesn't look anything like the, uh-huh. like the original bird that was in the picture. Um, so it applies very heavy augmentations and you train for, for more epochs. So you run through your data set many more times with much, much, harder to recognize images, but the same optimization problem. And the, the model doesn't overfit as quickly. It actually learns better. It uh, learns more robustly, uh, just having seen all these really, really challenging versions of the picture. Um, cut, mix, and mix-up are related uh, in that cut, mix is taking pieces of one image uh, in your batch and flipping it with uh, other images in the batch and then modifying the actual target labels to say, well, you've got a little bit of the bird and a little bit of the dog. So we're going to have uh, both of those uh, activated instead of uh, just one hot and mix up is similar, except it's the whole image. It's overlaying one on top of the other. So it's like blending two images and the corresponding labels the theoretical details on those and how they work, it, it's, it's in the in the papers, but in theory, they change the optimization landscape and somehow make it easier to learn. Um, again, with deep learning, some of the theory is like, well, is it correct or does it just work? It's hard to say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also uh, random erasing is another one that's uh, kind of deployed with those and it basically takes parts of the image and just blots them out with noise. Um, and uh, those were all combined in Tim in a way that wasn't really, to my knowledge, at least done before. So all of those, those are all separate papers and separate implementations. Uh, different researchers, different code bases had uh, different versions of them. And in Tim, I replicated all of them and kind of spend a lot of time making sure they integrated and worked well together and tweaked a couple of details here and there that seemed to improve uh, the training, especially uh, trying not to disturb the um, image statistics 
your mean and your the standard deviation of the input images. Um, some of the, like for instance, the, the random erasing or also um, uh, cutout is an, another similar augmentation. We'll just use a black image, uh, so it'll erase part of the image with the black box. But that can change. If you're doing that for every image, it will potentially change the mean if your black is not lined up with the, the mean of your, your data set, or it will change the standard deviation of the, the input images, which could impact the, the batch norm uh, running mean and, and variance stats uh, and pr like prevent uh, the model from converging well, especially later in training, I've found. Very interesting. You make effectively the input almost or often entirely unrecognizable to humans, yet the network trains better by being forced to also make sense of those new image inputs that are variations, wild variations on the original data. Yeah. And anything on the, the training side of things that was really important to get the maximum performance? There's sort of the overall training, training longer. So, so training longer. the original, <laughs> I think, ResNet um, was a... It's a very common uh, learning schedule. Uh, drop your learning rate by uh, one tenth every thirty uh, passes through your data set. Uh, for I guess a total of uh, ninety passes uh, for for ImageNet. Um, in the ResNet Stripe spec, we had several recipes, uh, and the, the longest was uh, six hundred. Um, and I've done some 800, 900 thousand runs where you can still squeak out a few more fractions of the percent, but it's definitely diminishing returns at that point. And then the, the schedule, uh, you was, you just cosine, uh, annealing in that. Uh, so a cosine learning rate schedule. It's a nice, like kind of hands off schedule that tends to perform quite well. Although I'm sure there are other, uh, options that could be deployed there as well. But definitely, I think it's improvement on the on the step. Now, I think bigger picture wise, it's it's really interesting what you did there because, and I think it's part of a, a bigger trend actually in the AI research community. It's still a, a smaller trend, maybe than most people wish it was. Is that traditionally people love to focus on one specific detail effectively of a neural net architecture or of a you know data augmentation or something very specific because that's how research tends to move the fastest in many ways. So you think about one specific new idea and you test that specific idea. But what you did here, you essentially brought together many of the ideas that were put forward independently in the past and showed how they can work together. And together can actually do much better than anything that had been done before uh, with ResNet architectures, um, putting it all the way to the state of the art, even though People thought that resonance were not state of the art anymore. Now you show actually they're still state of the art. You just need to bring in all these ideas that have been in individual papers, bring it together. And now through your open source code base, everybody can just use it going forward, which is really phenomenal for, for progress as a community, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had the luxury of, I guess, time to agree to, to, agree to be able to explore that combination without uh, a conference deadline or uh, paper quotas or targets to, to meet. I could just build, uh, explore, test uh, on my own timeline. And I guess that allowed me to, to, to do that. Whereas many researchers are definitely focused on, okay, we got to come up with something new, get a, a paper out, meet the, the, the NeurIPS deadline, meet the iClear deadline. Uh, and it becomes harder to have, you don't have as much time or freedom to explore combining uh, past uh, ideas and results. Now I'm curious if today somebody wanted to follow your path and you know, get into AI on their own, you know, in an independent way, not necessarily joining a research organization. Would you still recommend starting with Kaggle? And more generally, what would you recommend in terms of how to get started? I would definitely still recommend uh, Kaggle as a as a way to get started and also to get involved in the community and meet people and learn. Like there's way more people competing there now. I don't know, having not competed recently, I don't know how the, the sense of community is um, these days, but it's definitely worth looking at. There's other um, machine learning challenges out there. 
um, other platforms. I think Crowd AI had some interesting, especially reinforcement learning based ones. Um, those looked pretty exciting with GitHub and, uh, uh, Twitter, especially. I think you just got to get out there, start following people, interacting in different forums, different social media, uh, where other researchers are discussing ideas and just get involved. And I still think there's definitely a lot of room to, uh, participate in, uh, build something new and, and go the path that I did. Um, in terms of, uh, natural language, um, and also, I guess now image, the Eleuther AI group, like that's an impressive, uh, um, a pretty open, uh, open source, uh, collective of researchers that's doing some really exciting things with their own variants of, uh, like reproduced GPT, um, and then in terms of uh, open source organization, Hugging Face has been impressive in terms of staying quite open and invisible. But yeah, doing it yourself, I still think it that's definitely possible. Um, you just have to, you have to make people aware of what you're building and keep plugging away at it. And eventually I think you'll um, get some followers if you're building something that that's useful. Now, I imagine one of the biggest challenges when doing this is that so much is happening in AI, especially today, but even when you started, so much was happening. And wouldn't it be easy to feel like, you know, it's it's far out and it's hard to catch up. It's hard to become a meaningful contributor. And I'm curious, how did you do that when you started out? How did you just, you know, essentially sometimes not worry about it and, and just keep going and, and knew that you were making progress and we're going to get there? Well, I think that goes back to sort of my, the way that I measured my progress or set my goals was one bit at a time, uh, just get something useful out there, find a new result, build a new model, make some progress, satisfy, I, I'm a, I'm a very harsh critic of myself. And so satisfying myself is hard. Uh, and so that's always been like the, the thing that drives me forward is like, I want to be proud of what I've built and maybe I'm somewhat unique in that, but I can iterate like that and keep myself motivated by plugging away at hard problems until I achieve something. And that then drives me forward to, to do more and build on that. As you have Tim, the, you know, Torch image models library on GitHub and more and more people are using it. I got to imagine that you're also starting to see not just researchers use it, but maybe startups, bigger companies using it, not just for research, but for new applications. So I'm curious, are you seeing some new computer vision applications emerge that are exciting to you? I've definitely seen um, researchers uh, like Tim references popping up in in different uh, research papers, which is always exciting to see. Uh, in terms of uh, new and novel applications, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I'm sure there are some. I just don't have them in my uh, my head at the at the time. Because it seems like you could actually feed your angel investing in principle. <laughs> you could see people who do interesting <laughs> things with with your uh, library. Actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There were some random uh, emails that I got from some startups that were like, hey, we saw Tim or um, there was a, I had a re-implementation of a PoseNet, uh, a Google released a thing that tracks the human pose uh, and they made it available through um, the, the web browser version of uh, TensorFlow. And so this company uh, contacted me and they're doing some yoga exercise tracking startup and they're like uh, are you interested i was like that's a pretty cool idea actually but uh yeah i'm not sure if that's like up my alley but yeah it's really neat to see that you're using uh something i built for an, an idea like that now when you when you zoom out and think about the future of ai what do you think are some of the exciting things coming our way in the next few years, maybe even longer, five to 10 years? Well, uh, recently, I guess the, the really large language models have been pretty exciting. Um, from there, the combination of that with uh, vision, so the DALI and CLIP um, 
being able to feed a model uh, a description of something and then have it render uh, an image that is sometimes like very striking and realistic or very interesting interpretation of the text like that is i think incredibly cool uh so nearest term i think in that in that vein there's going to be some really neat art uh generative applications um for for images and potentially when with a little bit more compute uh we'll see some cool generative video uh video clips from text descriptions um going down the road i mean everyone's vision of what will be possible in 5 to 10 years is is quite different i'm not sure i have a any uh vision myself that will be realized or it's just I feel there's going to be some big inflection points uh where we're going to make rapid uh leap at some point. Right now it feels like we're making progress but maybe we're a little bit uh stuck. Uh there we need some new ideas to really push things forward to the point where we have models that quote generalize or um do better than modeling um probabilities and predictions uh, the, the the word understand is often associated with um these large models because it looks like they understand but i mean do they really is our understanding really just more data and more neurons or is there something more to it it's it's really hard to say so maybe by just scaling up the current approaches we'll we'll hit something exciting uh, and then when we see it we'll realize that oh yeah that's it or we could be missing some key ingredients and it's it's hard to say which that is but there's definitely those two camps i often see debates and uh back and forth on, on twitter and uh what not so i haven't set myself firmly in either camp i'm more open to see what what evolves and in the meantime i'm going to keep working away and uh trying to keep on top of everything well ross i think we covered everything that we had laid out here is there something that you had in mind that would be fun to cover but we didn't tee up yeah but other open source uh organizations um i think i already mentioned luther and hugging face uh briefly i think it's maybe important to highlight how important uh contributing to like releasing uh code is i mean even google and facebook are remarkable in that right now so much is being put out there uh that people like me can t- can work with and build on and organizations like hugging face are also uh very much working in the open for 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 most of their efforts uh and also maybe something else like data imagenet has been hugely influential it's amazing how much it still used a decade on from the original creation uh and then all of tim and pytorch image models would not have been possible is without that dataset existing uh going forward uh there's a lot of uh there's much larger datasets that are often in the hands of the private enterprises like the googles and facebooks of the world that people like myself don't have access to so i am i guess concerned about where the next image net is what it, who's going to make it will it be open and accessible for everyone uh and i think that could be harmful if we don't see more developments that are uh done in the open and available to all like imagenet was well ross this was absolutely amazing thanks so much for being on the show yeah thanks so much for having me it was a it was a really fun time uh, i think it's going to be really inspiring to a lot of people um i think your journey is just so unique i think you know a lot of people want to get into ai and it's such a great example of how it's possible even when you're not necessarily you know already connected with the you know leading organizations or universities from from the beginning or ever it's uh, absolutely amazing thank you